Um, I've, on the bottom of this first slide there, there's a URL, and that's to my own website. And so these, you can get these slides from the website if you want um, later. Okay, so I, I, what I'm going to talk about is the idea, the concept of life-wide learning. So the first part of the talk will be very much about exploring the idea uh, from different perspectives. And then I want to see if we can show you how we might apply the ideas. Uh, and then thirdly, at the very end, I want to try and see how these ideas might be connected to particularly the eco for learn project, which um, I heard about two days ago. Okay, I, I nearly always start with this picture. So I, I should explain, I just th think visually in pictures. So a lot of my slides have pictures on them rather than lots of words. This uh, picture is a picture of a conversation that I, we had in our centre at University of Surrey in about 2006. We were starting our project and we wanted something to remind us every day what it was we were trying to do. And what came out of the conversation was that really we were trying to help students prepare for a very complex world, a world of lots of messiness, where you know, linear forms of thinking and linear forms of education were not enough. So that, in a sense, is, is a, one of the starting points for me in terms of these sorts of explorations. Um, so really, I think this embodies really well a fundamental challenge which all universities, no matter where they are in the world, face. And it runs something like this. So for a, student, for a teacher, it's how do I prepare my learners for a world that is impossible to know 20, 30, 40 years time. Not the world of when they graduate and they'll get their first job, but no, the future. So how do we prepare them? What sort of experiences do we need to? What sort of ways of thinking do we need to encourage? Um, for a student, it's more like how do I prepare myself for this world of learning for 30, 40, 50 years, whatever. Um, and, you know, you think back 30, 40 years ago, like I can, and, and um, the world is a very different place. So this, it's, it's likely to, to change even faster than it's changed in my lifetime. So for students, how can I prepare myself? What experiences do I, can I have? Is, is, my, is my course going to give me enough experience? And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, they have to prepare themselves through every aspect of their life is the proposition I would put forward. And for administrators and managers and people who run universities, it's how do we create the conditions for our professional staff to uh, help their students by designing the right courses, designing the right sorts of environments within which they can develop in these sorts of ways. I mean, Caroline scares me enormously when she talks about the big data world. Um, but this is the world that people are going to have to occupy and come to terms with. So from my point of view, I think the idea of thinking ecologically is actually an appropriate way to think in a world that's infinitely full of complexity, in a world of disruption, a world where people have to reinvent themselves several times during a lifetime um, if my own experience has anything to do with it. So I think that is, that's my starting point. Now, I'm going to draw very heavily on my own life because it's the only one I know in any sort of detail. Um, so to illustrate these conceptual things, I need to have some, under, some detailed understanding about the, what it is I'm talking about. So I'm sorry, but it's, it's mainly my life. Okay, so um, here I am, the age of 12 over here. How on earth was I to know at the age of 12 that I'm going to be here today talking to you? <laughs> um, it's impossible. It was impossible then, 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 then. I might have started to think, oh, well, there's some potential now in what I'm doing um, that, uh, you know, I might get an invitation at some point from someone somewhere. But th the point is, you've no idea what life is going to give you, what affordances life's going to give you um, at any point through life. All you're doing is preparing for possible affordances because of the sorts of things you're interested in, the sorts of things you're doing through your work and through other aspects of your life. So my life then is really like sort of four chunks. The first one, say up to the age of 20, was very much dominated by formal education. But thankfully, I did other things outside that which gave me um, leverage, if you like, to be able to progress in, in ways beyond what education could provide. Um, I think it was essentially formal learning, you know, in classroom situations until I got to uh, till my PhD when that, that clearly opened up this whole informal world of learning, 
again. And then I went overseas and I taught uh, and did research and field work in, in, overseas, came back to UK, taught. Then I made, a, at that point in my life, I made a significant change in my career, which took me from the field of geology, which I loved and was passionate about, into education. And I went through a succession of, of jobs in different organisations. Um, and then last few years, I, last four years, I've been independent, as it were. So, so that is like the lifelong journey. So we live our for life forwards, but we can only make sense of it looking backwards. So it makes a lot of sense to me now. But actually, as you're going forward there, all, you're, all you can see is like the next, the next step. But the, the, the thing that we... The thing that enables us to take that next step is all this stuff that goes across our life simultaneously. So this is the life-wide dimension. So everything we're doing in every part of our life here is fundamentally things that we can affect. So I can stop doing something that I'm doing now tomorrow and start something new. Okay, that's not lifelong. That's a decision in the life-wide dimension of my life. Um, and so, so life-wide, as far as I'm concerned, Lifelong is the aggregate of all those life-wide possibilities. And the reason that I've um, devoted time to thinking about this is because I think education missed a trick when it, when it started to talk about lifelong learning. It subsumed this, of course it did, but because it subsumed it within this life-wide idea, to me it's a very abstract notion and difficult to operationalise. But life-wide enables us to operationalise it in our educational settings. Okay, so what is it then? So, I, I, you know, taking the, uh, a fairly standard uh, e European Commission type definition, lifelong learning, all the learning activity undertaken throughout life with the aim of improving knowledge, skills, competences within a personal, civic, social, employment related perspective. That's everything, isn't it? But actually, life wide here is all the learning, all the development, all the achievement. So, we, again, we, we, we simplify things by just saying learning when actually learning contains so many things. All that stuff that goes on in all the spaces that we inhabit every day of our life. And who you are and who I am is the integration of all these experiences, of all the learning we gain, of the different identities that we play in these different spaces. And that, to me, is why this is such a fundamental concept. It's the most, to my mind, the most powerful, all-embracing notion of learning. Okay, so again, drawing on my life, when you talk to people, they can normally identify four, five, six, or even seven sometimes, particular uh, parts of their life, um, which they can say, well, I'm, I'm in here, I, I sort of have a certain identity in here, I, I, I interact with certain people, I do certain sorts of things, uh, and learning related to that then is quite different to other parts of my life. So this idea of a, of a life-wide learning map then begins to emerge. So... As far as I'm concerned then, for LifeWide, it's now, it's all, um, it's very personal, and we talk a lot about personalising learning, but this is where it is, and significant. It's meaningful to me. I only learn stuff in my life that's meaningful to me. I don't learn a lot of stuff that is totally irrelevant. I try and focus on the stuff that means something. So it embraces formal and informal, intended and anticipated, need, interest, directed, self-directed, planned, emergent, decontextualised, contextual. All those different forms of learning can be brought to bear within the concept of life-wide learning. That's why I think it's, it's a powerful, powerful concept. Okay, so... We've talked already today quite a lot about context and how context um, are the rich environment in which we learn. Uh, they're fundamental to the notion of learning ecologies. And I, a few years ago, I discovered what I think is a lovely little conceptual framework. Sometimes the simplest frameworks are the best, aren't they? Um, so this was a, a guy called John Stevenson, who was very much interested in work-based learning. But anyway, what, what he said is the world can be divided up into sort of familiar and unfamiliar contexts, familiar problems and unfamiliar problems and opportunities. And you can ask people about different aspects of their lives and see where they fit. So if I just take my life again... Um, Okay, so most of my life is in this bottom left corner, the everyday routines of life. Okay, I'm very familiar. I can, I can almost predict what's going to happen in, in particular situations. Um, 
Um, so most of my life then can be mapped into there. But these other quadrants here, periodically, things happen that either push you into them or you want to go into, you push yourself into them, and they are become much more challenging. All these three quadrants are the areas where we have maximum potential to learn and develop. So in my case, and if I take my family, I have a large family, uh, one of my uh, children um, produced lovely twins three years ago, and I took on a childcare role one day a week. Uh, one of the twins is disabled as well. Um, so two boys, absolutely fantastic, love, love them to bits. But, you know, I was talking about dismantling a pushchair on the way here. It's, it's little challenges like that, how to take a pushchair down that really tax you sometimes. Okay, um, another aspect of my life, I do quite a lot of traveling, and this last 12 months I've been to China, um, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and now, and now here. And each of those environments is culturally very different to my own, and I, I get exposed to new ways of thinking and people and new ideas and total, and to me, that really takes me out of my comfort zone and it's, it's, it, it's, it stretches me and also leads me to think in different ways about things. Um, then if we take another work aspect, in the last six or seven weeks I've been involved in a mini MOOC. I've never been involved in a, in a MOOC in this way before and I've learned enormous amounts through that process. It pushed me out of my comfort zone and as a result of that now I know for sure I can do things today that I couldn't do six or seven weeks ago. Okay, and then in this bottom corner here, I'm in a band, for, um, and we, we are about to go into a recording studio. I've never been in a recording studio before, but we're going we're gonna to try and, we've, got, we've written some songs, play some songs. So I will definitely be out of my comfort zone in the recording studio. So I just il use this to illustrate that everyone in their lives has parts of their lives which are routine, but periodically you end up in different areas, different contexts, which... which help you learn and develop. And I think from an educational point of view, we don't ask this enough. Most of education is done in this box here. And, and students are, you know, exactly know what to expect. It's boring, they're not stimulated, they're not challenged. And I think you take any curriculum, you say, where in the curriculum are students meeting these, encountering these sorts of situations? And that's quite a challenging, quite a challenging question. Okay, so again, um, Let's develop this idea now, the combination of lifelong and life-wide. If we take one little bit of life, so this is my working life in the last 12 months. I, 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 have, I lead two, two social enterprises, one around life-wide learning, late education, and the other, I'm very interested in creativity and how we promote students' creativity. So within those two little projects, all these blobs here are what I would consider to be significant projects during this year where I've had to try and achieve something and through that process learn something. So they're mainly, we, we mainly um, have an organisation that produces magazines periodically and those magazines have a theme to them and all our research and scholarship goes into that, into that enterprise of producing the magazine over two or three months. So that's really to show that there's lots of these learning projects going on. Some of those learning projects, they have a boundary around them, like I showed you at the start, and you could say that for sure is a learning ecology in its own right. So learning projects can be, be learning ecologies in their own right. But others, I think, are more complex than that. And I would, I would use this seminar as an example. Um, Albert kindly invited me, I think, was it about April this year, something like that? Okay, so I knew a long time in advance that I was going to be here. Um, but as always, we're all busy. You put it off and put it off and put it off. And then about um, te maybe, t um, maybe 10 weeks ago, I began to think very seriously about what I was going to do when I came here. So I um, sort of built an ecology. We had various pro projects um, on, on, on the go, including produce, um, producing various magazines. But I needed to build in something which I thought would take me beyond what I already knew and understood. So I decided I was going to bring all the stuff I'd written about learning colleges together in a book. And of course, when you do that, you find lots of gaps and things that you have to try and address. So last 10 weeks now, I've had, I've had this as my major work project, a book. So I put it, and I've put the draft chapters online and invited people to, to come and, uh, and comment on it. Um, I did a workshop not so long ago at another university, and that, we made that theme a learning ecology theme. And then, as I just mentioned before, this... Um, mini MOOC that I got involved in and then of course the seminar today. I would see that as an ecology. They're all connected and I'll show you why in a minute and they're all giving me 
um, new sorts of information and knowledge as I process it, which is relevant to what, what's happening here today. So learning ecologies could be quite simple, project-bound, or they can be much more complex, involving several projects that you, you uh, connect, you, find mean, you connect in meaningful ways. So this is, this is the picture that was on the handout early on. So this is the way I try to um, encourage people to see their own learning ecologies is to get them to produce a picture, get them to produce a map. So think of a challenge that you have had to face. What did you do to meet that challenge? How did you learn? So they start putting down, well, I did this, I met this person, I went to this place, I went to this conference, I did this bit of online work. All those things add up effectively to an ecology, which is what I did. So the ecology here, the person remembers at the, at the heart of it. It's their ecology, no one else's. And they're going through some sort of process. And I, I, I rather like Harold Jarsh's um, simple um, tool in the middle here. You seek information, you sense that information, you process it, analyze it, evaluate it, reject stuff you don't want, you filter it. And then, and then having made sense, then you're in a position to share it uh, if, if, if it's the appropriate thing to do. So I've, I've, I've um, brought in all the learning stuff that I knew before about this from my past learning ecologies. That was my starting point, and they create lots of resources. But then I had to do lots and lots of stuff on Google. My, I, I created, as I said, this idea of writing a book, which, which um, as I say, I put a lot of energy, time, and effort into that. Um, I, that, it, that forced me to, to, go, to go open into, into, into the various personal learning networks I have in social media. I must say I've had been very disappointed with responses I've got from being an open, an open um, educationalist. And my, always my best fee com feedback comes from people I know and I have a relationship with and I can ask them for very particular things. Um, so anyway, I have got, I've had good support from people that I, I uh, tapped into. Um, I did that workshop which I mentioned over here, which was interesting because it was a, a group of um, about about 80 um, science, uh, science teachers, uh, academics, and uh, they were quite resistant to some of these ideas. And then the MOOC that I talked about before, Danny, I've run out of battery, um, uh, was a very important part of my, my work. And here we are today at the seminar in the middle right there. All those things, okay, I prepare for, uh, think about what I'm going to do, say, uh, provide resources, find resources, and then I get the feedback from the result of being in that, participating in that situation. You know, are these ideas any good? Yeah, they resonate. No, they don't. So it, I get the feedback from myself participating in these, in these processes. That's why I say, that's why all those loops are in there, because it's about, it's about um, giving something and then receiving something and then adjusting, adjusting in, in that sort of way. So you can see also that I'm using a lot of technology here. I, have my basic tool, which is my Vio laptop, which I love to bits, and I use a lot, quite a lot of social media as well to try and to try and um, find out, discover, whatever. Okay, so and I said I mentioned at the start, right? The fundamental process I think that, that all professionals are involved in, whether it's implicit or explicit, is this idea of self-regulation. You you uh, you're into a situation in a, in a in a situated context. There's a situation there emerging. You have to assess the situation. You have to assess it, comprehend it, and decide what you're going to do about it. So you then come up with some sort of plan of action. It doesn't necessarily have to be written down, but you, you know, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Um, and, uh, and then you try, you try your actions out, f you know, following that plan. And maybe they don't work, in which case you adjust and you try again, try something else. And that is the nature of being a professional. And then, at some point, you've seen enough of it to be able to make sense of what's happened. And it's that sense-making, that reflective process, the way you create new and deeper meanings, then, that you store and you can apply in subsequent actions in the future. Because that that's, that's very much sort of emotionally grounded in your, um, in your repertoire. So I, I think that's fundamental to the idea of learning ecologists. Right. One more sort of concept to throw in, and that is... In education, we are very much, and it goes back to this routine environment in the context, in education we're very much interested in incremental growth. You know, so our courses take students nice deliberately through a process. Okay, um, and much of what we do in education is that way, and that's why I was saying before these are the contexts, we rarely go into them. 
But life isn't like that, is it? Life is full of stuff that does not follow an incremental pathway. Um, so these, these two concepts of disruption, where we are pushed into situations that are not of our making, but totally disorientate, uh, disorientate us, um, uh, maybe sometimes de-skill us, but we end up in a place that we don't particularly want to be and we've lost something from before. Psychologically, there is a huge orientation process to go through in order to, in order to survive that. Often we are helped by people. Um, they help us, you know, and, and it might be very, uh, not in very significant ways, but we need the help of other people to get out of those situations. Sometimes you can't get out without other people's help. Okay, but on the top then, we also have situations that we, we may be pushed into, but often voluntarily we say, we're going to change this routine life. We're going to try and do something else that's different. And I've called those inflection points. They take us off on another trajectory. Okay, these two, these two uh, if you like, aberrations from the norm, to me, are the points of highest development potential. We probably feel emotionally stretched and challenged in both of those situations, but they offer us, if you like, the leverage to, to uh, develop entirely new learning ecologies. And I think we, f we often forget that in professional development. We just assume it's essentially incremental. A lot of professional development arises when there's fundamental needs. We change our job, we change our role, for example, suddenly made redundant. There's, we need to develop ourselves because we don't think we're as employable as we used to be. There are, there are fundamental points in life where people need real, real um, development in a way that they don't when they're in the day-to-day -day job. So when I map out my life now, these are the sorts of disruption points as that, that, that go through it. Um, and mainly inflection points, I should say. So a lot of them were self-determined and positive, psychologically positive. Um, but some of them were definitely enforced on me and, some, and caused me to rethink in, in significant ways. Um, now, the thing I would, I'd make, so these are the big points in life. You change a job, you then, you know, this job is totally different from anything I've ever done before. Where do you begin? Okay, so then you clearly are in a developmental situation. But the, um, it's a nuisance, it's not working. Uh, in, but in between these big, these big events are these things here, and these are the things that we're talking about, the learning ecologies. Potentially, each of these sorts of ecologies, which let's go back to the idea of project-based ecologies, provide you scope for inflection. You take on a new, a new sort of um, area of interest, and that offers you huge scope, huge affordance for then developing your knowledge, understanding, skills, and so on and so forth. So life, I see it as full of these big challenges and then lots of little challenges that help us develop incrementally. And I think a lot of um, the stuff that we're talking about within, say, the context of school teachers would be some of these smaller challenges that people are facing within a bigger vision of a, of a development of a professional teacher. Okay, I don't think I need to talk very much about this because I mentioned it earlier, but that was my console, right, so we've gone from the big picture view of lifelong learning with life-wide, incremental, life-wide right through it, um, grounded it and also um, commented on these idea of disruptions in life and inflection points. And then the third concept I see in life-wide is this idea of learning ecologies. And these are, if you like, the personal projects that we construct and configure over periods of time, typically few weeks, few months, but sometimes going on for a long, long time, um, within which we are having these sorts of relationships with these sorts of things which are embodied in this holistic notion of what a learning ecology is. But it's fundamentally about driven by purpose. I have a need, I have an interest, I have a purpose, um, and this, this is where I'm going to you know, base my learning ecology on. So going back to my picture of my own ecology for this process, there I've just superimposed the, all the things that are in that ecological diagram, the purpose, the affordances, everywhere has affordance. Okay, this is, this is a very interesting, which I've only really started to think about in the last couple of months, but everything has affordance, but we, we cannot always perceive it. And to give you a very good example of that, I was sort of aware of, obviously, the potential for, for um, things like Google+. Plus 
for example, to run communities from. But I'd never participated in one until this mini MOOC. Over six weeks, my eyes have been totally opened to the potential. And lo and behold, I've, I've set up my own Google Plus and I'm trying to draw in a community to work on it. And I've replaced a process that I had in the past for producing one of our magazines with an open community-based process using Google+. Now, I couldn't have done that six, a week, six weeks ago even. You know, so to me, that's a very current example of how your perceptions of affordance reflect your participation in something that enables you to understand what that something can do, what affordances it has. Um, so what does it look like from a teacher's perspective? Well, I, 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 I've, a few years ago, I was very fortunate to be uh, invited by a university to talk to a lot of teachers who'd undertaken innovation projects. So I, I interviewed about 22 of them, I think it was. So I have some wonderful narratives of how they managed, often struggled, to bring some sort of new practice into the, into the university. Anyway, from these, I was able to build various pictures. So um, this particular teacher... Uh, wanted to, to develop an online course for professionals in her uh, sector, which was fashion. So she did market research, uh, both interview base and questionnaire. She discussed the project with the head of, head of uh, school. She engaged experts from outside to help with the content, but she had to guide the experts and become their, their, their mentor. Um, she had, because of her innovation, was impacting in all sorts of ways on the university, had to resolve all sorts of problems within the university with different departments. Um, she she collaborate, collaborated in a wonderful way with the e-learning people in her own university and they formed a little collective which, which gave both emotional support as well as practical uh, and intellectual support. And then running the course itself gained the feedback through the first time round. That is a scenario that many of you will recognise as teachers in, in higher education is the way it happens. It's quite messy. You know, there's no plan, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and it's going to be like that. It's actually making it up as you go along. A lot of improvisation. That's why I think this is a wonderful vehicle for individuals' creativity. Okay, so how do we apply it then? Sometimes I've talked to audiences like the one that I mentioned earlier at a, a, a university in, in England where I had stony faces for most of the time and then suddenly, suddenly someone said, ah, I, get, I get it now. And it was through showing this picture. So this is a picture of a young man He's uh, finished his, his uh, degree in archaeology two years ago. And uh, so when we talked to him, we wanted to know what, what he'd done to learn to be an archaeologist. Okay, so he went to university knowing nothing about archaeology other than what he saw on the television. Um, and so he said his course was my backbone. It gave me you know, the basic knowledge I needed, but more than that, it gave me sets of relationships that I thought would be very useful to... Well, I used, basically. Um, and then... Outside, outside his course, though, he did lots and lots of things. So on the left there, the red blobs, he went to conferences, conferences where, which were attended by many academics, not many students, but he really liked going to conferences. So in the final year, him and two other people decided they would run their own national conference for students uh, of archaeology, and they had the first of these, and it's been handed over to other, other universities since then. Um, that he, he also got involved in the magazine, the student magazine, which was done outside. It was all informal learning. Um, and then on the right-hand side, unbelievably now, but archaeologists only get very small amounts of fieldwork. Um, so he had to go and find his own digs to learn how to be an archaeologist. And um, one of these, that one I've, I've labelled Year 2 Homeless Heritage, the dig involved homeless people in his town, his city, which was York. And they w the students worked alongside homeless people doing archaeology. And it, that changed him completely into someone that would never have met these people. He comes from quite a privileged background, never met uh, the, um, homeless people before. And here he was making friends with these people and, and understanding what it was like to be a homeless person. One of them actually died during the dig. So these, have, these sorts of experiences have profound impacts, impacts on people. Anyway, the long and the tall uh, short of this story is that that picture there is the true picture of that person's ecology for learning, developing and achieving while they're at universities. And unfortunately, many universities don't recognise that the things that students do outside their courses are actually contributing hugely to developing them for that sort of picture I gave you right at the start, this complex, unknowable, messy 
disruptive world. Okay, so my experiment then is to um, was at the University of Surrey, which I, I, I went to, I think, in very, very late 2005. But we, we really got interested in this whole idea of life-wide learning in 2008. So it's about, for about three years, this experiment I'm going to describe. Lovely campus, um, you know, high up in the research rankings. But its, it's important educational claim to fame is its commitment to developing students professionally. So they, they, their students, about 70% of them, have within their program work integrated learning, whether it's totally integrated or whether they go for a, a year-long experience, a large proportion of them actually engage in the real world outside their course. So they have an advantage right at the start. So, so the traditional honours degree then with the work-related curriculum was the university's model. Our job then was to say how can we add value to this? What can we do to encourage students to think even more about this world of informal learning and get, get value and benefit from it? So we... Be, we, 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 we created this idea of a holistic curriculum, a, a, a life-wide curriculum that covered all the, the possible experiences that students would have within uh, their experience while they're at university. That included the co-curriculum, the spaces that universities designed outside the formal curriculum, and all the stuff which we call extracurriculum, which is what students do for themselves, the jobs that they have, the volunteering associations and so forth. And so we realized that we had to create something which would recognize this learning. So we created an award scheme, called it the Lifewide Learning Award, and um, created some frameworks uh, so that students could, could themselves demonstrate that they had recognized learning gained in these other spaces. So how does it work? It's very, very simple. A bit like the picture I was showing you before. We encourage students at the first step to build a Lifewide Learning Map. So here you are in year one. What are the spaces in which you're, you're inhabiting, you're learning in, while you're, while you're on the course? And this example is bioscience students. She talked about mentoring other students, obviously a social life, a friends, looking after herself. She was very keen on sport, and she volunteered for St. John's Ambulance Service. But the thing that during the first year she decided to do was, that's not enough. I'm not, I'm not fulfilled enough. I need to push myself more and more challenged. So she organized a group going to... Um, event going to Uganda, which I'll talk about in a minute. So from the map, you then say to the student, right, well, what, you know, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to develop in yourself? What aspects of yourself do you really want to change and why? And this is where the purposes come in. So this is led by purpose. Uh, you know, and her purpose, she eventually wanted to study medicine. So her long-term goal, her distal goal, was about becoming a doctor. And everything she was doing in her life was geared... Not, not just to, to getting a good degree in biosciences, but to becoming a doctor ultimately. Um, so, and that is really, it's a rough plan. And that plan at the bottom says, and be aware that a lot of stuff's going to come through here that's not in your plan. So you have to allow in your planning for emergence of, of stuff. So again, mapping onto those contexts, she managed to f identify a few people who wanted to come with her to Uganda. They spent about six months raising money for mosquito nets mainly, and the medical supplies which they took with them. They went to Uganda, spent I think six weeks in Uganda helping in the medical center, in the schools, and the experiences they had again profoundly changed this particular person here. She's holding a 14-year-old girl who had um, AIDS as a result of being raped. Um, and she and her group of students managed to negotiate with a relative to accept her into the family so she could receive medication. And she then went away and started funding part of that. So it, it transforms people, these sorts of experiences. And we saw it over and over again. She's exceptional, but we saw it over and over again within the student body of people doing this. She came back. They, they then spent the next year um, setting up a student organization to enable more students to go out and complete with the project. So these things don't end. These ecologies go on. Um, Okay, and how then do you record it? Well, it is really important to narrate, to, to build a story as you go along through these processes. We said um, that we, we, if you provide us with a shoebox and you're able to narrate the artifacts in the shoebox, we would be happy. We would accept that as evidence and we could, if, if your story was compelling enough, we would, we would, we, we would go along with that. 
Um, no one did that, by the way. But that was just our, our if you like, our symbolic way of saying, we, we will adapt to the way you want to record your story. It's what's meaningful to you. Quite a few students use portfolios. But you know, we were, we were amazed at the number who chose a scrapbook, who put their artifacts and their thoughts into a scrapbook. And the way we then, we interviewed them, they told us the story in the scrapbook and we recorded that story. How am I doing for time now? What, how many? Five. Okay. Um, w since I left the university now, we've set up our own award scheme. I'm not going to say anything about this, but if you go to the LifeWide Education website um, URL, that will take you to the award. You can see the information around that. I just In the last few minutes, I just wanted to say something about connecting to what I've seen and heard here. So fundamentally, colleges are about people. People with purposes and motives to learn and develop themselves. So that picture is really about, about that sort of scenario. So taking the teacher, so I was very, um, I was really um, thankful that you gave us the insights into your projects and have a little bit of time to think about it. So hope, hope this is okay just to say these initial ideas. Okay, so, so a teacher then, so a teacher, let's say a science teacher has got a struggling with the concept to teach, the students aren't getting it, what does he do? Well, he can, he can talk to colleagues, obviously, in his own environment, and often that's where the source of, of knowledge will come from. Um, um, he builds a process, in other words, to try and get at this. And this particular science teacher is very savvy with the technology, so he will, he will get onto his networks. He already participates in these sorts of forums. Um, so he's able to uh, access the social web, and sure enough, people say, oh, there's YouTube clips here of this, and, it's, and it, it will really help you, and so on. And he tries them out in the classroom, so he goes back into his environment, his practice environment, and does it. And yeah, gosh, these two or three ideas really work. And then he's, because of the sort of person he is and because of his connectivity, and he believes that if he's taken from something from the social web, he will put something back into the social web. He shares what he's learned. He's shared his own intervention and, uh, and that. And in the same time, he's built up this meaning-making process, and that ecology knows will work he will try that ecology again in the future. So in other words, um, you know, that, that's a successful intervention. But there could equally be a successful intervention by the person who isn't conversant with technology. It's just simply talking to colleagues or going to a, uh, a science teacher's meeting held every three or four weeks and, and discussing it with colleagues there. You don't need the technology. But what I would say about the technology is that it offers hugely more affordance for doing things quickly for opening up resources that you would never get at any other way, and to my mind, uh, being creative. I think it opens up creative possibilities that you, you can't imagine if all you're dealing with are the everyday resources that, that you have. So I think that, to me, is the real, um, the real message, if you like, that, that, you, that, that, that um, would, would be well received within, a, within an education system. So just, I'm going to finish now on my recent experience of participating in the social web. It was, um, this was um, like a mini MOOC, although the organiser didn't want me to use the word MOOC, which was interesting, but anyway. It's a mini MOOC um, around the theme of creativity in higher education learning. And it was great because there was a group of students, about 20 students from Greece, master students, participating in this MOOC. So I could see a lot of... A lot of people like myself who were interested educationalists, but also a group of students and seeing what benefit and the way they participated in this MOOC. So that gave me some real insights. So it was nicely structured. It was scaffolded learning. There was each week there was like a topic and there'll be a few activities which those who wanted the certification in the form of badges were able to get if they provided the badge uh, related um, evidence for it. So that went on over six or seven weeks. But within the community space, oh, so there's community space where people can post the results of their activities and people can comment on it, which was one of my main jobs was just simply to acknowledge and then to comment on and try and draw out a bit more from the, 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 the students. And then there were also these groups. Now the groups were, were intended to create collectives, people working together on a project that was of interest to them. So we, we, our, our little collective, about six people, was really focused on how this was all working. We were interested in creativity and the link with emotion and, re and, 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 and how people who became more emotionally involved did more, gave more to the community, and, and we thought that was really exciting. So, and the links were then to student portfolios, 
Um, so we could see all the evidence of their learning in the, in the process. But they also had, I should say, face-to-face -face meetings because the students were obviously being taught in, in classroom spaces as well. And so it seems to me that, if this is, this is my closing slide now, that you, know, you can build an holistic model of learning in the social age um, in which we have to recognise that people, not machines, not technology, are at the heart of these ecologies. People and their challenges in life that they're trying to resolve, and the, 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 the technology, the social media in which people learn adds enormously to their ability to solve their challenges. Seems to me that's the right way of looking at it, um, it from, my, from my particular perspective. So, there is information on the web page I set up. Um, there's, a, there's a book in draft. You're very welcome to go in and comment on it. And um, thank you very much again for the fantastic opportunity. Thank you.